All right. Hello, students. Welcome to another video lecture for ComSci 125 Operating Systems. Uh, we are in the topic on concurrency, concurrency, and we discussed the first two chapters related to concurrency, which is some introduction about concurrency. And this time we're going to talk about locks. I as mentioned in the previous uh, video, the locks are used to ensure that only one thread will be executing in their critical section. So in this chapter, we're going to discuss how these locks are actually uh, implemented in the perspective of the implementer of the locks. Uh, in the case of just an ordinary programmer, the way the API for acquiring and releasing the lock is basically just using the lock function uh, given a particular lock variable and then the unlock function given the particular uh, lock variable. So let's get started on this topic. Okay, so the basic idea about block is that uh, it ensures that any critical section executes as if it were a single atomic uh, instruction. As I discussed in the previous video, whenever uh, uh, it's possible for certain programs to have what we call a race condition because the final value will depend on the execution path uh, for the particular problem. So there might be a case that there might be a race condition. So we have this example, balance equals balance plus one. This is a critical uh, section code. So we can use a lock, which we call here mutex, lock of type lock underscore T. And then we uh, call lock on the mutex. And then we perform the critical section. And then we unlock the mutex. So while the thread holds the lock, no other thread can execute uh, this uh, piece of code because it might lead to critical uh, to a race condition. So that's the idea about the basic idea about locks. So the lock variables holds the state of the lock. Okay, so we'll discuss how this is implemented later. When the lock is available, available or unlocked or free, no, th no thread holds the lock. And when it is acquired or locked or held, exactly one thread holds the lock and presumably is in a critical section already. That's the idea. So the semantics of lock, so lock, uh, this function, uh, so again, I mentioned a while ago that we have two main functions when it comes for API functions. We have the lock and unlock. So the semantics of the lock function is to try to acquire the lock. And if no other uh, thread holds the lock, the thread will acquire the lock. And then the thread can now enter the critical section. And we say that when a thread is in its critical section after holding a, a lock, we said that it is that that thread owns that particular lock. Other threads are prevented from entering the critical section while the first thread that holds the lock is in there. So we have this uh, in P threads, right? we have the mutex lock, which is used for little exclusion. So here is, here, is, here is how it is used. I think the, I discussed in the previous chapter. So p thread underscore mutex underscore t, we define the lock, and then you have to initialize the lock with the p thread mutex initializer const, uh, constant, and then uh, not necessarily a constant, but this uh, value here, and then you call p thread mutex lock, and then p thread mutex unlock. Sandwich in, in between this is the critical section. Right. So we may be using different locks to protect different uh, variables. So we can have multiple locks, and uh, therefore we can increase the uh, concurrency in a more fine-grained approach. So we now move on to the question of how do you build a lock? Let's say you are asked to implement your own lock. 
But as I said earlier, if you're a programmer, you don't usually care much about how locks are implemented because you're just interested in using or in calling the lock and unlock functions. So uh, this uh, part of the video will focus on how, how do you build a lock. So efficient locks provide, uh, provides mutual exclusion at low cost in terms of uh, implementation cost and uh, performance cost. Okay. And building a lock will need some help from the hardware and the operating system. So recall that uh, when acquiring a lock, the, uh, this operation should be performed atomically. That means it cannot be interrupted. Meaning uh, when a threat is trying to acquire a lock, it can either acquire the lock or not. Right? So that's, that what, that's what we mean by atomicity. So how do we uh, evaluate a particular lock implementation? There are three criteria that we can use to evaluate the effectiveness and efficiency of a lock implementation. The first one is mutual exclusion. Does the lock work? Right? Does it prevent multiple threads from entering a critical uh, piece of code or a critical section? So that's one criteria. Is it correct? So the next one is fairness. Does each thread contending for the lock get a fair shot at acquiring it once it is free? So it's possible that multiple threads will be trying to acquire the lock, but uh, in terms of fairness, does the implementation guarantee that all the other threads trying to acquire the lock will eventually get the chance to acquire the lock and thus uh, run in their critical section? And the last criteria, the third criteria is the performance, which is the time uh, overheads added by using the lock. So uh, remember that in implementing the lock, it will require some code. So does the code uh, add to the overhead right, in terms of performance and also in, the, in terms of the scheduling? So let's start with the first approach, controlling interrupts, right? So uh, remember that when a processor is executing instructions, it uh, interrupts uh, can be generated to interrupt the normal flow of execution. So in order, uh, in implementing locks, we would like to somehow be able to uh, prevent interruptions because we want to focus on acquiring the lock, right? So uh, one way to accomplish that is to prevent interruptions from being interrupted or from, let's say, we don't want to be context switched. The main reason, the, the main reason that uh, race condition might happen is that the thread scheduler might perform a thread context switch. So we don't want to perform a thread context switch when we are in our critical sector, when we are trying to acquire the lock. So we can use, we can disable interrupts. So one of the earliest solutions is used to provide mutual exclusion is the STI and CLI, uh, is the disabling and enabling interrupts. So this is actually implemented in, in the kernel, right? So in x86, we have the STI and the CLI instructions, which are used to enable and disable interrupts. So this usually was developed, uh, this was actually developed for single processor systems. So we have void lock here. Uh, disabled interrupts and then void and lock, unlock enabled interrupts. So what's the problem? This is a very simple implementation, but what is the problem? What are the problems with this approach? The first one, it requires too much uh, trust in applications, right? Uh, when an application is allowed to enable and disable interrupts, we're trying to, uh, we're, we're, tr we're trusting that application too much. What if, what if at some point, the that application did not enable the interrupt after uh, disabling it. So what will happen? The system will now, uh, the entire system will no longer be functional because it cannot receive uh, the interrupt. So uh, there's a problem, there's one problem. Another one is it, do, uh, it does, uh, Disabled interrupts do not work on multi-processors, right? Because each processor has its own interrupt, interrupt mechanism, interrupt line, actually. So when you disable uh, 
the interrupt on a process on a single core or a single CPU, it does not necessarily disables the interrupts uh, in other CPU cores. So that's the problem. That's another problem. The third one is the code that must or unmust interrupts be executed slowly uh, by modern CPU. So we don't want uh, to prevent actually uh, interrupts from being processed because there are important interrupts that needs our attention or that, that needs the attention of the operating system, for example. So by disabling interrupts, you're actually uh, disabling uh, other events from being uh, processed or being acted upon. So that's the problem with controlling interrupts. So uh, that's the first approach though. So let's try uh, a software, uh, another approach. Why, not, why don't we just use a flag to denote whether uh, the lock is uh, held or not? So this is uh, a way of a software solution. Right? So let's try to code this flag. So we have type dev struct uh, under, underscore lock underscore t. And then we have the flag here and we define it as the lock underscore t. Then we, initial, we define a function in it uh, for initializing the lock, basically setting the flag to zero. And then uh, we can use void lock and lock underscore t star mutex. And then we have a while loop here, which simply checks whether the flag is one, right? So we test the flag. And if uh, the flag is still one, when you say when the value of flag is one, that means that the lock is held. So uh, we do uh, nothing. So this is called the spin waiting or doing nothing. So we continuously check whether the flag is one, right? So while it is one, we do nothing, right? And if it is not one, then eventually uh, we might get a chance and then we simply set uh, this thread, the calling thread that calls this, this lock function will set it to one, which means that that thread now holds the lock. Okay? And then we reset the flag to zero. So this is a purely software-based solution. I will show some demonstration later for this particular approach and the problems that might arise because uh, in this approach. Okay? So what are the issues here? So the first one is, again, our criteria for evaluating an implementation of locks are correctness, fairness, and performance. So the first one is that it does not guarantee mutual exclusion because obviously we have a race condition in the, in the value of the flag, right? in the flag variable. Right? So this is what will happen. In thread one, it calls lock. And then while executing this, while, while doing this check, it is interrupted because another thread is scheduled. And then thread two is uh, thread two is set to is set to schedule is to run and it calls it also calls lock. And then while uh, it performs the check, right? And then eventually it got the flag, flag equals one, and then the scheduler switched to thread one, right? And this time it also uh, 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 set the flag to one. So this means that there are now two threads holding the same lock. So it does not guarantee the uh, execution, uh, the mutual exclusion uh, criteria, right? So the correctness criteria. So that's a problem because of this uh, race condition. And another problem is a spin waiting. It wastes time waiting for another thread, right? So the code here, uh, this one here, this is called spin wait, uh, spin waiting. So uh, it's uh, when a thread calls this function lock, it will uh, loop continuously. This, do, this, is, this is doing nothing essentially until waiting for another thread to set the flag to zero so that immediately it can grab this, uh, this, uh, this value, okay, this lock. Okay? So that's the problem. So we, so the, uh, we therefore need some uh, hardware, okay, hardware support in order to implement a correct lock because we can't guarantee atomicity in this example because of the scheduler. We don't have control of which thread will be scheduled. 
Okay? So we need to have hardware support. And the first one is the test and set instruction. So, so most processors will have uh, instructions that uh, hardware primitives that we can use to implement uh, these locks. So first, let's start with the test and set or the atomic uh, exchange. So it's an instruction to support the creation of simple locks. So this is the pseudocode for that in test and set. And it has two parameters, a uh, pointer to an integer and a new one. So what it does is uh, it returns okay, at the old value pointed to by PTR. Okay? And then it simultaneously updates setting the said value to new. Okay, so this, this one here, right? And these three operations are not are, are performed at, uh, atomically, meaning they cannot be interrupted. Although as shown here, it is composed of three steps, one, two, three. Okay, since this instruction is built into the hardware and is atomic, meaning all of this will happen. Uh, uh, not all at once, but the, the execution of this instruction will not be uh, interrupted. So we can think of this as a single instruction which cannot be interrupted, right? So how do we use this hardware primitive to implement a lab? So this is how it is done. So we, we use the same pattern. We have the, the, the same flag. Okay. And then uh, we initialize, of course, to that to zero. And then in the lock implementation, this is now our new code. So in the previous uh, software-based implementation, while it's a simple code, while mutex flag equals equals one. Right? So in this implementation using test and set, so we have while test and set, okay? address of the lock flag, and then, one, uh, and then the second parameter is one. So remember that the new value will be one. Right? And uh, it will return, note the test and set will return the old value. So when the uh, while uh, the return values is still one, meaning it's still held, then we simply uh, spin weight, right? But this code here uh, is this instruction is atomic, meaning it cannot be interrupted. So there is actually no race condition, right? That uh, that can happen, right? And then for the unlock, we simply uh, set the flag to zero, right? So note that, that to work correctly on a single processor, it requires a preemptive scheduler, because. Uh, uh, we are doing some spin weighting here, so uh, it there should be a preemptive uh, a timer that will interrupt that can interrupt the execution of a thread, right? So this is a very uh, basic uh, uh, spin lock. Okay, so uh, maybe it's better to uh, show an example of this. Okay, so the working problem or the main problem, the synchronization problem that we're going to look into is the producer consumer uh, problem. So let's take a look at uh, Prodcon C. So the, uh, the producer consumer problem uh, is a, a basic problem. So it's an implementation uh, of uh, the PRODCON from chapter three of the old textbook that I was used, uh, I, I used in, other, uh, in other authoring of this course. So we have uh, this producer consumer problem where we have two threads, the producer and the consumer, right? And then they share a, a buffer, right? So they share a buffer and the producer, uh, there are two, also two variables in and out, right? In and out. Uh, in is used to is used by the uh, producer, uh, for by the uh, by the the producer, 
to place a value on the buffer, and then out is used by the consumer to uh, determine the first uh, full position, which is consume a value. So this is the main function. It, it creates two threads, the produ produ producer thread, the consumer thread, and then it change the name of the thread, and then P thread join, and then it turns zero. Now let's take a look at the uh, thread function, right? So the thread function uh, uh, is very simple. So uh, we look for a number of iterations. Currently in this code, we have uh, n iter, which is 100 iterations. And then we produce a random, a random number, which is the next produced. And then while uh, in plus one, okay, uh, percent buffer equals equals out. Okay? So meaning there's, uh, there's no free slot, okay? So we spin wait, okay? we wait, and then uh, once we have uh, some some free slots, okay, uh, we place the produce item there, and then produce a value. So the consumer uh, is the opposite. So if in is the same as out, then uh, the buffer is empty, so it will consume nothing. Okay. So this is uh, one implementation of the producer consumer problem. But we are interested in another implementation of the buffer consumer, uh, producer consumer problem with uh, a race condition. So this is the code, okay? The solution to produce the problem using a counter to be able to use all slots in the buffer. So in the previous implementation, uh, we cannot use the entire uh, available slots in the buffer. So we should we can only consume n minus one slots in the buffer. Here, uh, we want to provide an implementation that will utilize all the slots in the buffer. Right. So it's very, almost the same implementation as you can see. So you have the thread and the two threads, and then we join the threads, and then here we use a counter. A counter, which is used by, uh, by both the by both the producer and the consumer. So in the producer, while counter equals equals buffer size, that means that the all the slots in the buffer are uh, are are filled. Okay, right? so when that is uh, true, then we simply uh, look. Continu continuously check whether the counter is still, uh, uh, whether the buffer is still full, right? So after placing, whenever a, a slot is available, okay, after placing uh, an item on the buffer, so we increment counter plus plus, so that's the idea. And the opposite is done on the consumer. So we subtract, uh, we decrement counter. Right, because if the counter is zero, the counter is zero. That means uh, there are no slots yet. Right, so let's try this uh, code. Right, so GCC minus O uh, prod from race dot L prod from race dot C minus B right? Okay, so we. Then we run the code prod one race dot elf, and let's see what happens. So, so notice that uh, this simple run actually showed uh, a race condition on the variable counter, right? So remember that our buffer has five slots: zero, index zero, one, two, three, four, right? So you can see that. Uh, the counter here is uh, some value here. See this five, uh, this value five, okay. Uh, on that, uh, so, sorry, correction. Uh, the the values, the counter will the values will be zero uh, to four, zero, one, two, three, four, because you have five slots. But at some point, you will notice that the, uh, the value is five, 
Okay? So there is obviously a race condition for that. Okay? So at, so at some runs, in some runs, we can get the correct result, final zero. But as shown earlier, we were, we were able to uh, get the final answer of one. Okay? So that's the, the idea of, of this. And sometimes it also hangs because the producer finishes first and it does not produce additional items. So eventually the consumer will, will have, okay? I will wait, we'll try to wait, but there is no more producer. So eventually uh, it will fail, right? You can see here. So how do we solve the, this, uh, this race condition? So we solve that by using uh, implementing LUX. And one way to implement LUX, as discussed in the slides, is the by using the uh, test and set approach. So you have test and set approach. So I have some code here. Okay. So in this implementation, example implementation, we use the test and set instruction. So here is an example implementation of the test and set instruction. And actually in x86, this is how it is implemented. So exchange uh, Q, okay? So we, have, we, we use some inline assembly code here to implement the test and set instruction. So shown here. So we have XCH exchange Q and then uh, two parameters, the old value and the new value, okay? So we return the, the result, okay? As shown here, okay? So how do we use this uh, in the uh, implementation, okay? So in the producer code, we need to get the lock for the, before entering, before incrementing counter plus plus, which that is our critical section. So what we do is to implement a global variable uh, lock here by initially set to zero. And then uh, we have this code in the producer while test and set lock. Okay. While test and set lock, we, uh, is this correct? Okay. So, So when after doing this, uh, I think I missed one parameter. Is this test and set? Yes. So this is the loop, right? Test and set. And then uh, once the lock is acquired, okay, uh, we increment the counter and then we reset the lock to zero, which is basically the unlock code. And uh, this one also. So while test and set lock, Okay, uh, try to get the hold of the lock and then uh, decrement counter, which is the critical section, and then reset the flag or the lock to zero. So that's how it's uh, that's how it's used. So we can GCC minus O prod from test and set prod from test and set C minus P thread. There you have uh, prod from PAS, PAS.elf. Okay, so it executes uh, and uh, the producer consumer problem, and we are interested in the final counter, which is zero, which synchronizes the, this one synchronizes the. Uh, producer and the consumer. So we should be expecting that the final counter will be zero. So something like that. And for the one with the risk condition, this is what sometimes we get the value of one or we get, we hung on the consumer process. Okay, so that's the implementation, the basic spin up. You can check the code and study it. 
from uh, the extra course materials. Okay, so let's evaluate the spin locks. Okay, so is the spin lock correct? In the implementation correct? Yes, the spin lock only allows a single thread to enter the critical section. Fairness, no. Uh, the spin locks don't provide any fairness guarantee. So still a competition. It's still dependent on the scheduler, which uh, thread the scheduler will uh, execute, will, will select to execute in the processor. And it's also possible that a thread may spin forever. And it will never really get the chance to be scheduled by the thread scheduler. Now, in terms of performance in the single CPU, performance overload overheads can be quite uh, painful. Why is that? Uh, if the thread holding the lock is preempted while in critical section, other threads scheduled will just be running on the spin code. Right? So they will just be uh, competing, uh, spinning on the while loop. I will test and set, right? So they will be, uh, they will be running in this uh, spin weight. Right? So basically do not doing anything uh, important. But if the number of threads are roughly equals the number of CPUs or processors, the spin locks work reasonably well. So if a thread waiting a lock is a different CPU than the thread currently holding the lock, then no issues if critical section is Sure, because uh, it is running on a different core, so no problem when it comes to scheduling. So spin locks will be uh, better actually for for uh, multi uh, multi processor systems. So the next uh, atomic instruction. So we have test and set. The next one is compare and swap. So what it does is to test whether the value at the address pointed to by pointer is equal to the expected. If so, uh, we update the memory location pointed to by PTR with the new one. And in either case, return the actual value at that memory location. So if you look at the pseudocode here, uh, int actual uh, so we store the PTR here. Right? If actual is equal to the expected, then uh, set the PTR to new and then return the actual. Right? So you simply return the actual value at the memory location. Right? So that's this is the third step. Right? So Using this primitive, how do you implement the lock uh, function? So this is uh, the same in the test and set. So while compare and swap uh, lock uh, flagged, so zero is the expected, right? And then one is the new value, right? So it will this function will return uh, the the actual. So while it's still being held while the while the lock is still being held, you simply spin. So again, this is an atomic uh, instruction. So here is an example, uh, C callable function for compare and swap. So let's take a look at the source code implementation. So, uh, so VI prod con uh, compare and swap. So, this is similar to the code for the test and set, right? So the solution to the prod problem using counter to be able, uh, okay? So yeah. so we have counter, uh, and then uses compare and swap. Okay? So almost the same code, but this time we use we have the compare and swap uh, primitive. So again, this is the uh, this is the value PTR. This is the expected and the new value and for the x86 processor is what we have. We have comp xchg for the for the instruction. And then we have uh, percent one and then percent two. Okay. So first we store the previous value. Okay, and then uh, this is the new value. 
So these are the parameters. Okay. So it requires some uh, inline assembly, but uh, the process is still the same. Okay. So before entering the critical section, we do a compare and swap. Uh, this is the lock variable zero on one not equal to zero. Okay. Uh, do nothing. Okay. Uh, for the consumer. Okay. Uh, if the lock is still being held. Okay. So not equal to zero or equal equal to one is the same. So do nothing, right? And then you enter the critical section. So uh, let's run this. Uh, GC, uh, let's build this. And so prod con compare and swap. Compare, uh, prod con compare and swap. C minus red. And prod con compare and swap with L. So here I did not uh, display any immediate value, but you can see we always got the counter zero, meaning the producer and the consumer are uh, by the uh, are using the locks effectively. So that's the idea. Right? So that's compare and swap. Okay, so it's almost the same code as the one I shown earlier. So we also have a load leak and store conditional for other architectures. So the store conditional only succeeds uh, if no intermittent store to the address has taken place. So we have a load link instruction here. We simply returns whatever is passed here. And then the store conditional instruction, which is uh, we we'll return, uh, we'll return one in, and update the value at PTR to value if success, okay? And if fail, the value at uh, PTR is not updated and zero is returned, okay? So again, this is our hard, these are hardware instructions, right? So I think it's in the MIPS uh, processor, so there. And this is how to implement lock using the load link and store conditional. So uh, we have a while loop and then uh, while load link. So this is spin waiting while load link lock flag plus one uh, spin, uh, spin, uh, spin on that. And then store conditional. So this will only succeed if uh, successful in obtaining uh, the lock. Okay? So otherwise you repeat the process again. Okay, so that's LL and uh, SC instruction for the MIPS. So we have a shorthand here, which uses short circuit uh, evaluation. And we can also have the fetch and add instruction. So fetch and add atom atom atomically increments a value while returning the old value at a particular address. So you store the old value and then you increment that and then return the old. Right. So this is, uh, again, it's a hardware primitive. What is being shown here is just uh, a uh, pseudocode, in a way, a pseudocode for the instruction. But this is atomic. Everything here is executed in its entirety. They cannot, the execution cannot be preempted. And this special uh, instruction can be used to create a TCAT lock. And this is how it will look like. So you have... Uh, uh, the ticket and the turn, and then you the ticket initially set to zero. And then my turn is fetch and add. So remember, it returns the old value, okay? So fetch and add the ticket. So once the ticket is obtained, okay? And uh, if the lock, uh, if the turn is not equal to my turn, so you simply spin, so, there is a turn uh, value here. Okay, so turn field in the lock. Okay. So it's not my turn, spin. Okay. So the advantage of this approach is that it it's, it, there's a guarantee of fairness, unlike in the spin locks, wherein there is no guarantee of fairness. Okay. Because the idea here is this check. Okay. If the the value of the lock 
and the value of the turn field of the lock is equal to my turn, then the thread that calls this will be guaranteed to, uh, to execute, right? So somehow there is a guarantee of fairness in this approach for the TCAP lock. So, so far we discussed uh, the spin locks by right? using different hardware primitives like uh, test and set, compare and swap, uh, LLSC and fetch and I. So the main problem, these are all spin locks because there is this waiting, uh, waiting section of their implementation. Right? So, so much spinning, uh, hardware-based spin locks are simple and they work. And in some cases, the solutions can be quite inefficient, as I, as, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of fairness, when you have the fetch, uh, traditional spin lock for the test and set, okay? So, and uh, some threads will be wasting time spinning uh, while, waiting, while waiting to acquire the lock and of course there is some uh, there's no guarantee in fairness in other implementations except for the fetch and add and in terms of performance also uh, spin locks are better in or better used in uh, multi multi core systems because you have uh, especially if you have short critical sections so how do we avoid spinning then right how do we remove this semicolon? Basically, that's what we mean by uh, avoiding spin locks. How do we remove this semicolon in our implementation of locks? Right? So we need the operating system support in addition to the hardware primitives. So a simple approach to be able to remove that spinning, that uh, empty semicolon, is to use to just yield. Remember our uh, in our uh, limited direct execution, right? We're in. We, as we can assume that all user processes are uh, good, not non malicious, so they can just use the yield uh, system call to transfer control back to the uh, to the operating system kernel, right? So when you're going to spin, you instead of spinning, doing nothing, you simply give up the CPU to another thread. So here, the OS system, uh, the system calls, moves the caller from the running state to the ready state. So the, when you call yield, the, the thread will not, uh, will not be scheduled to run on the, uh, on the CPU, right? So it will be placed, its state will be set to the ready state instead of the running state. So it will, it will change its state, right? So when that happens, okay, there will basically be a context switch, right? So whenever you change the state of a process from, from running to ready, for example, there will be a context switch. So the cost of a context switch can be substantial, okay, if you perform just the shielding. And then uh, the starvation problem still exists, okay? There are some threads, again, it's still dependent on the scheduler, right? So the starvation is still uh, will still be present even if you uh, uh, if you use yield here. But the good thing here is that we remove uh, we were able to avoid the empty semicolon line, right? So here we have we are no longer uh, spin waiting, right? So we totally give up in, in a way. We totally give up. Okay, just let the others uh, compete. For for uh, for the lab, right? So um, that's a problem with yield. So the next one is why don't we why don't we just put the thread to sleep instead of spinning and uh, instead of yielding, right? So you might wonder what's the difference between uh, yielding and sleeping. Uh, in yielding, the state of the thread will change from running to ready. But in sleeping, it's still uh, it's still scheduled, it's still running, but it's not uh, uh, executing instructions. So it's, in a way, it's, it's put on hold. Okay? 
So that's the main difference between sleep and gym. So the uh, the cue, uh, there is also a cue. So instead of uh, yielding, you have a cue where the sleeping threads can wait on, right? So the, the cue is used to keep track of which th threads are waiting to enter the tap. So you have this cue, and I think this is in Solaris uh, processor, uh, Solaris operating system. We have the part uh, call, which puts a thread to sleep, and also have an unpark call to wake up a particular thread given a thread ID. Okay. So, how is this used to implement our locks? So this is how our locks lock will now look like. So we still have the lock T type, the structure, and then we have the flag, we have a guard, and the queue where the sleeping threads will wait on. So we initialize the lock in this manner, lock to zero, guard to zero, and then initialize the queue uh, in this manner. And then our lock function will now look like this. So while test in set, okay, so we have this spin lock, right? Not that we still have a spin lock here, but this is actually shorter compared to, to the by just the basic uh, test uh, the, uh, spin lock. And then once we are able to access this guard, okay, this guard lock, okay, we uh, set the flag to zero. Okay, uh, we check if the flag is zero, and then we set the flag to one. That means we acquire the lock, and then we reset the guard to zero. Okay. And then if, if, the, if the flag is not zero, it's held by another thread, what we do is we add the thread that calls this lock to the queue. Okay. And then you also set the guard to zero and then put the thread, the calling thread, the, the thread that calls this lock to sleep using the part call, right? So here, the, the thread, uh, the process did not yield, right? but rather it's simply sleeping, waiting on this uh, queue, right? And for the unlock part, so the unlock function, so again, we check for the guard, okay? So uh, check whether we can acquire the guard, so basically by, uh, Spinning, spin lock, and then you check if uh, the queue is empty. So uh, no one is on the queue. So you simply set the flag to uh, zero. Okay? And then otherwise, if there is a, a, a thread waiting on, the, on that queue, you unpark that. So you hold the lock for the next thread. So there is a, a discipline, a line discipline for. Uh, for the threads waiting to acquire the lock. Okay? And then eventually you let go of the guard and then proceed with the execution. Okay? So the essential thing here in the use of queues is that uh, the threads will not uh, be spinning uh, uh, needlessly. Okay? So they can be put to sleep using this spark call in the, in, in the case of Solaris, while uh, waiting for, for them to be waken up to get hold of the, the, the lock. Right? So there is a queue wherein these threads will wait on. Right? So that's the basic idea about using queues. So this a better approach. Okay? So, uh, wake up and the waiting race. So it's also possible to have uh, 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 a race condition in this uh, in this implementation of uh, views, right? But we have uh, in Solaris uh, we have the set set park function, right? So in case of releasing the lock, there's a thread A just before the call to park, okay? So here, releasing the lock before the call to park, right? So here, guard is zero, right? Uh, thread, B, uh, thread B would sleep forever, right? So it's possible that uh, 
uh, thread B will uh, sleep forever because of the uh, discard condition here. Okay? So before calling park, okay, uh, guard is uh, uh, thread A is interrupted, so the execution is only until here. So thread B would sleep forever because uh, part will not be uh, executed, right? So Solari solves this problem by adding a third system called set part, right? And by calling this routine, a thread can indicate is about to part. And if it happens to be interrupted and another thread calls on part, right, before part is actually called, the subsequent part returns immediately instead of sleeping. Okay, so remember that uh, unlike in the other implementations of, uh, of the lock, or just the page pin lock, we have uh, a synchronous, uh, synchronization uh, step here, where in part must be called first before and part. Okay, so in order to prevent this uh, race condition, there is a set part here, okay, which is inserted uh, just uh, at this place so that uh, this race condition can be avoided. So the la last part is about few text. So this is our additional uh, Primitives also similar to the park and park system calls in uh, in Solaris, but this one is in Unix, right? Uh, in Linux, so we have Futex weight and Futex uh, weight. So the weight puts the calling thread to sleep. If the value at address is not equal to uh, expected, then returns immediately. For the weight, uh, wake one thread that is waiting on the queue. So here's an example of, uh, in, in Linux, we have the native uh, POSIX uh, threads library, NPTL, right? So you have this uh, sample mutex lock implementation. So you, oh, very similar to the one in uh, Solaris, right? So you have a while loop here, and then uh, also have the atomic, uh, test set. So you can check uh, the source code for NPTL and how this is implemented. Okay, so you have the call to a few text wait here, which places the uh, calling thread to sleep, okay, and it's added to a queue. Okay, so we also have uh, two phase locks, okay, which is also uh, in Linux, available in Linux. So in a two phase uh, lock, okay, so uh, what it does is, is that it realizes that spinning can be useful if the lock is about to be released, right? So if the lock is about to be released, so uh, it's better to just spin lock than uh, perform additional steps like uh, putting the thread to sleep and adding it to a queue, right? So the, in two-phase lock, uh, the, there are two phases, the first phase and the second phase. The first phase, the lock spins for a while, hoping that it can acquire the lock. If the lock is not acquired during the first spin phase, a second phase is entered. So the second phase, the color is put to sleep and the color is only woken up when the lock becomes free later. So it's just a mixture of the spin lock and the queuing, uh, the queuing part, okay? So that will cover our discussion on the uh, lock implementation, I encourage you to try the source code uh, in the extra course materials that I provided. Open side, one, two, five. That will be all. See you on the next video.